Welcome to the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, episode number 340. The obstacle in the path becomes the path. Never forget, within every obstacle is an opportunity to improve your condition. Ryan Holiday. Broadcasting from the back alley in Hollywood, it's the Indie Film Hustle Podcast, where we show you how to survive and thrive as an indie filmmaker in the jungles of the film biz. And here's your host, Alex Ferrari. Welcome, my indie film hustlers, to another episode of the Indie Film Hustle Podcast. I am your humble host, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is sponsored by my new book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, How to Turn Your Independent Film into a Money-Making Business. In it, I discuss how to actually create the film entrepreneur model and how to make money with your film or films and do it again and again so you can actually build a successful career and business. So if you want to pre-order the book, head over to filmbizbook.com. That's filmbizbook.com. And if you haven't already, please sign up for my new podcast, The Film Entrepreneur Podcast. Just head over to filmtrepreneur.com or filmmakingbusiness.com is a quick little hack to get there. And that way you'll get a ton of new information about uh, how to become a film entrepreneur, how to become an entrepreneurial filmmaker and make a living with your films. So definitely check that out. Now, today on the show is that companion piece I was talking about in episode 339 on how to deal when a a film project falls apart. And today's guest reached out to me through email and sent me this ridiculously long email, which generally speaking, I don't read because I don't have time to read that kind of, you know, text. I just, I'm always so much, so busy. So I normally don't read that kind of uh, email uh, because I just don't have the time. But for whatever reason, I started reading a couple of words and it just grabbed me. And the, today's guest is, his name is Theo Hogben and he is a filmmaker and tribe member. And his story was really remarkable because he was telling me about a short film that he had started and that was sitting on his hard drive for close to four years. And there was no reason really that he hadn't finished it. He had just kind of built up this monster in his head that, it, you know, for whatever reason, his life was falling apart. He was really in a dark place. And, you know, it was kind of this albatross, this thing on the shelf that was kind of a sign of his failure as a filmmaker. And he had heard a few of my Tough Love episodes here on the podcast, and those episodes really kind of got the spark going again for him, where he finally got up off his ass and did something about it, finished his short film, and is now moving forward in his life. I mean, he went down to the point where he was a 30-year-old man living at home with his parents. He had to move back in because he had fallen so deep into a dark place uh, financially and emotionally and spiritually and physically, everything. And he really just needed a way out. And this short film ended up being his way out. And he started to clarify his his mission in life, his his calling, what he wanted to do. And I felt that this story was something that we all need to hear. Now, many of you know my book, Shooting for the Mob, and that chronicles arguably the darkest time in my entire life and how it took me years to come out of it and to become a filmmaker again. And I think we all go through that at one point or another in our lives where we are going for this ridiculous dream of being a filmmaker, right? It's a crazy dream. We're nuts. We're we're pirates. We're carnies, whatever you want to call us. It's kind of nuts to become a filmmaker because there's no stability and so on and so forth. But for whatever reason, it is a calling. It is something that once you are bitten with that bug, there is no vaccination for it. There is no cure for it. It will always be with you. And I thought that this story would kind of shine a light on it, and to let you know, if you're listening out there, that you're not alone, that we all go through it. And Theo was gracious enough to come on the show and be completely vulnerable and honest about every aspect of his dark journey, all the way from going down into the pit to all the way back out of it. 
and showing all the ugly warts and all. And he really wanted to come on to kind of pay it forward. And his hopes are that this episode and his story inspires somebody else out there listening in the tribe to get up off their butt and either start working on their movie, finish working on that movie, start or finish writing that script that they've been on for four or five years, whatever your situation, you're not alone. We all are going through it. We have gone through it or just getting out of it, or we're going through it right as we speak. So without any further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Theo Hogben. I'd like to welcome to the show, Theo Hogben, man. Thank you so much for being on the show, Theo. Oh, lovely to be here. Thanks. Now, um, you, the, the genesis of how you got on the show is very interesting because uh, it's a very unlikely <laughs> way to get on the show. <laughs> but you <laughs> sent me an epic email, which as anyone who – please, everyone listening – I do not read epic emails. I just don't have the time to read like full blown, you know, Bible size <laughs> emails. But Theo sent me this very compelling story about how he made um, or lack of making his short film. And I was really, really impressed with the honesty and everything that he put into that email. And I said, you know what? I think this might really help, um, help a lot of the tribe listening to the story. So, I reached out to you. I said, hey, you know, you want to be on the show? And I think you crapped yourself when I said that. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. I was so happy about it. You know what's really weird right now is yeah. um, because because I listen to your show so much, mm-hmm. and I do other things when I listen to the show, obviously. Like uh, when you get recommended, you want to you want to listen to podcasts while you're doing somewhere, you're driving somewhere. And I'm, it's really um, – it's kind of spitting me out because it feels like um, – <laughs> I'm listening to the podcast and I'm like, oh, what else have I got to do right now? Like, <laughs> <laughs> your, your subconscious mind is completely on. Yeah, because you've associated my voice with doing odd things around the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I'm always listening to Indie <laughs> Film Hustle at the gym or something. So it's like um, – yeah, I should be it's working. Really, it's if you really want, interesting. If you want to do a couple burpees or some push-ups while we do this episode, I completely understand. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> um, so, but I think thanks again, Theo, for um, for reaching out to me. And uh, and well, before we get started, man, how did you even get started in this business? Um, well, the weird thing is, like, I I always wanted to be a filmmaker. Um, I never really had uh, any kind of people in my life that really knew anything about it. I I grew up on a farm in a county called Gloucestershire, England. Um, mm-hmm. Actually, Simon Pegg's from here as well, so I uh, got that. You got that going for you. So, yeah, yeah, I got that going for us. It's kind of like uh, the Harry Potter town. Everyone sounds like uh, hobbits here. Um, <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> I've, lost, I've lost my accent. Uh, I've been away for a while. Um, but, yeah, I, uh, I, I always wanted to be a filmmaker. I always wanted to tell stories um, however I could. And, obviously, I went through school um, I went to university to study film and then uh, I ended up in Norway and I tried to break into the film industry there, get whatever job I could. And it was a real uphill slope when you go to another country where you don't speak the language. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't understand how uh, how people live and work there compared to what you've done. Like your fresh face. It's like growing up a second time. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, made it through, tried to make some film- films here and there. Um eventually you made my short which i'm guessing you guys will hear about later um and and honestly i don't th- i can't see myself doing anything else um no matter how far how low i get or um how well i do or if i do well well in something else maybe the goal is always to make films there's there's nothing else man it is a sickness it is a it is a it's a horrible sickness that we have uh, and it's it, it, it it's true you know we 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 have it's it's <laughs> i always tell people you know being a filmmaker is like having herpes because <laughs> because occasionally it flares up and you just have to deal with it or it's it's subtle and it's quiet in the background and it doesn't it, you know it's just it's in hibernation but it's always there <laughs> well when Oh god! One thing I was saying to some uh, people today was uh, like, so the amount of money that I spend on film festival submissions. Oh, don't like, get me uh, started. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So I wrote, so I said to him like, dude, some people need 
types of drugs, some need sex, some some need gambling. For me, I spent all my money on submitting to film festivals. <laughs> we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. <laughs> Which you should have you should have downloaded my my free guide on how to submit film festivals for free. Oh. <laughs> God, yeah, no, I, I did. I did actually. I've submitted quite a few for free, but some of them they just they will not budge. Sure, yeah. I get you. No, I get you. You know, it's funny. You know, because as you were saying that, like, no matter what I do, no matter how bad hard it gets, I have to be a filmmaker. And you know, a lot of times we as filmmakers, especially when we're not in the, you know, we don't know any other filmmakers, let's say, or we we have very few filmmaking friends. Uh, you you feel like you're alone. You know, you feel like I'm the only one that goes through this. And I felt the exact words that you've said were exactly the thoughts in my head throughout my career. Like I tried leaving the business multiple times because it got so difficult. You know, you know about, I'm sure you know about my book that, you know, the mob, you know, when I almost made the movie for the mob, that yeah, almost, I, that almost I, destroyed me. Crazy. Yeah, that almost destroyed me. You know, there were so many of those kind of, oh, almost there, oh, almost there, oh, almost there kind of thing. And it's brutal, but at the end of the day, there's nothing that you can do to get rid of this. It's herpes. It's you're just stuck with it forever. <laughs> but a good uh, herpes. I think it's a good herpes depending on how you look at it. <laughs> I, I absolutely love the way that's being described now. <laughs> <laughs> You'll never look at filmmaking the same again. I'm, that's what I'm, I'm here I'm for. Sorry, I'm sorry. Listen, uh, this is the <laughs> phone call. I didn't really want to make it, but um, yeah, I've got filmmaking. I've got, I've got, filmmaking. I've got, I've got <laughs> filmmaking. It's uh, there's no cure and uh, there's no vaccine for it. So I'm just, it's just gonna, it's just gonna be there. <laughs> you should probably get yourself checked. <laughs> you should probably get yourself checked. <laughs> oh, that's horrible. Oh, that's horrible. Oh God, I've gone down. We've gone down the wrong path. Oh uh, anyway. yeah, I'll tell you what. I'm, I'm gonna have to tone down my sense of humor in a public <laughs> setting. It's, uh, it's atrocious most of the time. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Now you, the reason why you're on the show is because of your film, uh, your short film, "The Most Savage Beast," which is a perfect title on so many levels uh, <laughs> for this process that you went through. What was the genesis of this film, and why did you want to tell this story? Okay, so uh, basically, it was. Um, I don't know if you did. You get to watch the film? Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I watched it. it. It actually looks really good. Like it had really good production value. Uh, it had a great little story to it. It's it's interesting. That's why I was asking, like, what made you what what made you want to go down the road with this? Well, basically, um, as I said, it was, a, <laughs> it was four years ago now when we mm -hmm. uh, when we started. And the way I wrote it was, um, I'd actually watched uh, Amelie. Mm -hmm. uh, at Beautiful the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing is that Emily is quite a cute film. It's mm -hmm. a very, you know, um, she's, she's lovely. Oh. The thing she does, she does to help people. Mm -hmm. And I thought, what if someone twists that? Mm -hmm. Just a little bit. Because what she's doing is so, I mean, if you took a little, if you looked at it from a different angle, it's absolutely horrific mm -hmm. what she's doing. She's manipulating everyone around her. And then I, yeah, obviously I started with that kind of small idea and then I thought, okay, what if it's a bit more obsessive? Um, what's the end goal of the main character? Why does she, she want to do this? And in the end, I kind of transferred, transformed this character that, which essentially I, I wanted to turn it into a God. Mm -hmm. So in the film, it's actually Cupid. It's a female representation of Cupid. And then all over the film, there's scattered little bits of, um, little bits of things in each scene which tell uh, that story. Mm -hmm. and, 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 that was, and that was, well, that's a good way of always, and that's a great idea for anyone listening. If you just take something that's looking at it one way and just completely take it from another point of view, you can create uh, some original, some really nice original material without question. Now, you started, uh, you started on, the, on the path for this film. Uh, tell us the, the process, like what was the budget and how did you get the cast and the crew and all that stuff? And this is also, by the way, your first thing you've done, right? Yeah, this is the first, uh, the first short movie I've made, like under myself, it wasn't a student project. It, it was basically all under me. Mm -hmm. Um, and it just, it, yeah, it, it, it was crazy what happened. I just didn't expect it. So what happened? Uh, <laughs> so, so, well, first of all, what was the budget? 
Okay, um, I don't know whether I should say this, Budget, because I've taken your advice and I've obviously read Rebel Without a Crew. Mm-hmm. <laughs> should I want to sell it one day? To be honest, it's a short film. Yeah. It, um, it, it I costs, mean, it Theo, costs... Theo, stop that, stop that. It's a, it's a short film. Just tell us how much it cost. <laughs> okay, yeah, it was it was about it was about um, forty thousand Norwegian krona. Wow. Which, that's yeah, a... which it's about. I guess that's four thousand pound. What's that in dollars? I've never. That's actually less. That. That's actually like five, Well, depending before or after Brexit, I don't know. But um, <laughs> but I think as of right now, it's probably like uh, I don't know fifty five hundred dollars, something like that, six thousand dollars, something like that. Yes, six thousand dollars, something okay. like that. Yeah. So yeah, I got about thirty thousand from the Norwegian government. They've got like this young people's fund, nice. and I was that's yeah. It's really nice. Uh, I was about 26 at the time, so I was at the kind of cutoff rate to, to get that funding, and I was really lucky I got it. Um, and a friend of mine in my, uh, I, li- I lived in this thing we call a collective, so it's kind of like an apartment, but you have six people living there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, yeah, and uh, but, well, he got me onto it basically and said, This is, you should definitely apply for this funding. Hell, man, they'll just give it to you. And that's how it is with Norway, with the, uh, with the funding system. You come up with some idea, I'll throw money at it sometimes. It's fantastic. I okay. never realized that before. So we all should move to Norway is what you're saying. Got it. Oh, my God, <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, so you have your money, uh, which is amazing. So you've, you've got it funded. So is any of this, none of this money is coming out of your pocket or is it all kind of external? No, uh, a lot of afterwards also came out of my pocket. Um, at the time, I had bar, I've had worked in a bar, so I kind of saved my tips. I saved whatever I could up to put into this film. Mm-hmm. Um, and what happened was I, uh, I, you know, I sat on the money. The plan was to kind of get a few friends together to make, you know, my first short film, which I thought was going to be, you know, it was going to be a small thing. I, I didn't expect it to, <laughs> to, 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 yeah, to, to be what it ended up being. But, um, so I had a friend uh, called Annie, she actually lives in LA now, so Mm -hmm. uh, she gave a shout out to her and she's an amazing musician, Um, and I made a few music videos for her in the past, and one day we just got talking and she said, you know, you should really try this, I know some actor friends that you can, that you can bring on board with this, and we should actually make something of this, and I said, all right, okay, all right, okay, so yeah, we got the actors, and nice. I rang a few, yeah, I rang a few cinematographer friends that I'd known from, because what I would do is like, I would also be a freelancer. So I would get the odd job here and there in the film industry as mm-hmm. like a PA mm-hmm. or uh, been a fixer a few times in Norway, um, you know, set, set assistant, things like that. So I'd, I'd met a few people in my past that I knew could help. And uh, as one cinematographer, he sent me in the direction of another one um, called Robert. And Robert was basically the best thing that ever happened to this film <laughs> he was like it looks fantastic it looks fantastic yeah so he was the dop and it's just something that i did not expect so what happened was i went for a meeting with him i sent him the script he's like yep yeah, script's amazing um yeah what do you want to do when do you want to start we can have a meeting went over and met with him <laughs> and to someone that hadn't really made his own film before i was just shocked by how professional this guy was Mm-hmm. Like he had so many apps. Um, he knew everything you needed to know about camera angles. He was well connected. He uh, he was like a lecturer at one of the uh, universities in Oslo. So he knew everything that you could possibly need to know about making a film. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> So, yeah, so then it started, and I, I, I brought the few friends that I had together. I said, okay, we're going to shoot on this day. And then he brought the people he knew together to mm-hmm. sit because people just wanted to work on projects. And I think over the course of a week, it went from a crew of about five people to a crew of 26. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, what? what? Yeah. Like, okay. So I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna stop you there for a second because I want to I'm gonna point out a few things as as we tell the story as you tell the story. Yeah. Um, so I'm assuming that the DP that you hired he he's a working DP he's very well established and and he's used to working on bigger budgets right? Yeah yeah he's uh, yeah we uh, actually after we done the principal photography of this film we. Um, we ended up working on Snowman together uh, with Michael Fassbender. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So he's used to working on bigger shows. 
So when you come, when you bring on a DP of this magnitude and this experience, a lot of times they don't understand the budget or they just don't understand how to create the look or actually do their job without a certain amount of support. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. So I have DP friends of mine who couldn't do, couldn't light something without at least 10 guys to do it. And then I have a DP who does everything himself. And the image will will both be similar. It's just different perspectives of doing it. And that's a big mistake that a lot of independent filmmakers make when they start off is they bring in someone like this who's really professional, really high, but then all of a sudden they, what, what they bring along is kind of like the baggage that they bring along they, you can't handle it. So in other words, like, uh, oh, I could give you an Alexa for free. Oh, great. But I only have a laptop to edit with. Well, you're not going to be able to make this thing work because you can't handle the workflow. So always look at, you always have to keep that in mind when hiring crew, especially, you know, key members like the DP, because can they handle this budget? Are they used to handling this budget? Are they not going to give you attitude on the set because they don't have, you know, 15 guys doing something that a low budget DP could only do with like by himself or with one other guy. So I just, I'm pointing that out as kind of like a lesson for people listening, be, be aware of. Uh, so is that why it ballooned from five people to 26? Like there was just a lot of people that they, he needed or like what, what were all these crew people all of a sudden that showed well, up? Well, no, ba- base, this is the interesting thing. All the people that came on board, they were generally students. There was very few people there that were actually just not um not full-time professionals uh it's not not filmmakers mm-hmm. uh or students or something because all the students that came the weird thing is they all went to this one university i should give i don't know if i should give a shout out to them because they were that good but the mm-hmm. yeah, it was called noroff um mm-hmm. I, uh, you you edit stuff right so i don't mm-hmm. know if this yeah no no uh, i won't I, I won't be editing this so it, whatever comes it comes <laughs> oh god oh, damn it <laughs> um, don't worry about it it's all good yeah yeah um yeah but basically they all went to this university and uh, they were so much like more talented than i had ever realized the the university i went to here in england mm-hmm. did not teach us anything really <laughs> fair enough and i saw these yeah i saw these guys came out they they knew how to light something fantastically like they knew how to put all the dollies together. They knew how all the grip stuff worked fantastically. They they knew how to set up a schedule um, so so that everything ran really smoothly. Um, everyone knew how to stay in their own lane when they when they were on set. Um, mm-hmm. Nothing got confused. You know, you had the job, you did it, and you did it well. And no one complained. Or it, I mean, it was it was it was absolutely over the top how good they were. And these guys were students. So which so which is which is so so far, everything seems to be moving along quite nicely, sir. You have yeah. a budget that was given to you by the government for the most part. You've mm-hmm. got a nice DP who knows what he's doing and loves your project. You've got yeah. talented people working for free as students. Um, I so where is the train going to get off the tracks? Because it seems like it's oh, moving. It, it, it seems like everything is is moving along quite nicely. Actually, nicer than general. Generally, yep. in most short films. So, are. Would we agree on don't that? Don't worry. It's don't worry. It's coming. Okay. So, uh, <laughs> so uh, during the production, was there anything that happened? Uh, you know, when when did when when did the fit hit the shan, as they say? Okay. <laughs> Not heard that, and I love it now. I'm so stealing that from now on. Go for it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so basically yeah so actually for for the principal photography stage of the film it went smooth it went really well we did like uh we did long days so 15 hours on most days oh, and then nice. 20 on the last day oh, on a five-day shoot uh, we shot in places where i worked so bars like 90 percent mm-hmm. of the film takes place in bars so i, I used what i could um, of course you know yeah absolutely um yeah but then, then principal photography finished, and it was time to edit. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, Post production, yeah. the beast. Post production, the, the savage beast, the if you thing, will, sir. The thing, yeah, the most savage beast. <laughs> um, it was, it was the thing that I also didn't really account for in terms of budget, because obviously we spent the money on cameras, food, set, um, all the things that we did, and 
I had a friend that said she would edit it for me and she, she did, she did an amazing job editing it. And my assumption was that it was going to be edited and then, then we could put it out and it would be fine all the way to go. How wrong I was. Mm -hmm. So what (laughs) happened, sir? Okay, so we, we got the, the rough edit back. Uh, um, and my friend, she's uh, Karin, she's, she's an amazing editor, but she put her heart and soul into everything she did and she just, she burned herself out editing it. She was editing so much, but she did an amazing job. And I said to her, I was like, it's okay, you can stop doing it. What I'll do is I'll step in and I'll finish the film and... And yeah, that was it. So I let her go. It was all good. Um, and then I started editing it and I, I wasn't happy with it basically. Like, um, I just couldn't. And I tried finding another editor as well. Um, Mm -hmm. I couldn't seem to find anyone. Something was happening. It wasn't going right. Um, and at the same time, my home life was, um, descending rapidly. It was, it was, everything was going downhill for me. Mm-hmm. In terms of work, money, uh, love life, all that kind of stuff. Um, and when, you, when, when you're making a short film, you're either doing it because you're not getting paid for it or anything. You're doing your day job. And then in your free time, obviously, you're making the film. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that's, yeah, that's what takes up most of your time. And for me, um, my, my free time was spent dealing with, you know, life problems. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Life has a way of doing yeah. that. Exactly. Exactly. So at the end of the day, time was moving on and, um, it was getting further and further away from, from reaching our goal. Cause we wanted obviously the film and to be put in festivals by the end of the year. Mm-hmm. And that kept going. Um, Sundance deadline is what you were looking at. <laughs> yeah, I'm just, I'm uh, just, yeah, I'm, but, I'm just going to ask him. I, I actually had I, I as a kid I'd gone to the Berlin Festival, so that was the that was the one that really hit me that I always wanted okay. to get in. Yeah, okay. it's an uh, yeah, interesting one. Um, yeah, just but yeah, basically my life then fell apart um, okay. because of all these things that were happening happening around me. And I what I did was I had all the footage on me and I gave it to the DOP Robert and I said, "Dude, can you find someone for this?" Uh, to see if you can, if you know an editor, if you know someone, he's like, yeah, I'll see what I, he said, yeah, I'll see what I can do. And what happened next was, uh, snowman, snowman, uh, we started shooting snowman. Um, and Robert, cause he was the, um, I think he was the assistant, uh, assistant DP on it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. He was on set the entire time. I worked as a freelancer on it, so I would go in occasionally, but yeah, he was, he was on set all the time, barely getting breaks and I couldn't get through to him. So I couldn't get my hard drive for quite a few months. Oh, wow. Yeah, exactly. So, and the thing is when you're making a film, if you lose that momentum, you kind of, you forget what your, uh, your vision was in the first place. Mm -hmm. So that's what was happening to me and all these lessons, um, I was learning at the same time. I had no clue about it. Um, and yeah, Things obviously went from bad to worse. I ended up working in the bars at the same time thinking that I've got this film. I've got the principal photography done. It's so close to being done. What is wrong with me? I can't seem to get like, if I want to be a filmmaker, I can't finish a short film. What is wrong with me? And I just, yeah, it just made, made you feel worse. Well, let me ask you a question. Why do you think that you, cause you, yeah, sure. The, you sure you didn't have a hard drive for a couple months. That's, that's fine. Mistake number one, always have a backup. So we, uh, we understand that now. Uh, but there is, <laughs> there's a big, it seems like there's a bigger underlining reason why you weren't finishing. Uh, it, because it's not, it's, you know, I understand about outside influences. I get it. Trust me. Mm. Trust me. I understand it. But if you truly want to get it done, you figure a way out. You figure it out. There's 24 hours in a day. You figure something out. And that might fly for a couple months, two, three months here and there. But then if it, you know, you're talking about years now, there must have been some deep underlining reason why you didn't want to finish it. Do you even, do you even know what that is? Or have you ever thought about it? Yeah, I don't know. It just, it became this crux. Um, Like I, it just, it's like the drive sat on the shelf. 
And I would like once I got it back from Robert. That is mm-hmm. the the thing sat on the, that that thing at this point. Like I hadn't lost interest. It was always in the back of my mind, like that the, the little the little devil in the back of your head that's always that's always there. Um, and it, it, yeah, it just sat on the shelf gathering dust. And because because it was such a thing, like every time I looked at it, it was like you haven't been able to even make a short film. It, it became this kind of weird spiral that you you didn't want to look at it or you didn't want to work on it we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor and now back to the show because Mm. it just all this negativity had surrounded this small thing that should have been done very quickly but because of all these essential problems that you couldn't face. Like another thing, I couldn't face it. That's another problem I had was that myself, like myself, I couldn't turn around and say, you know what, Theo, it's you as well. It's there's something holding you back. I don't know what it could be, but it's it's in the back of your it's it's always in the back of your mind. Maybe you think you're not good enough. Maybe maybe there's um this chaos that's that's swirling around in your head that's saying you know you're not you're never going to do it um like i yeah it was horrible <laughs> yeah no i i understand i understand so the you know i i, I get it god man i get it so badly i've you've no understanding it took me until i was 40 to shoot my first feature yeah film exactly, because of, because exactly. of this because of these 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 stupid voices in your head of um, these kind of constructs that you create in your own mind. And, uh, you know, this is a great example of a spiral. Like you create a negative kind of tornado or, or downward spiral in your own mind. And it just builds upon itself again and again until you can't, you, you can't do anything. You can't move. You can't move towards anything because you are just – on kind of like a constant attack by your mm-hmm. uh, uh, from yourself by the words and the ideas and the thoughts in your own mind, where now it, it, it this stopped being about a short film a long time ago, you yeah. know, it, right? It's just like this is more about demons or things that I'm dealing with as a human being, but then also as a creative, as a filmmaker, and going through all of that is just so rough. But I think. All filmmakers go through a level of this at one point or another, whether it's, you know, Spielberg after he made 1941, you know, you know, because that was a huge bomb after he had so many big hits. And then he had to kind of like, whoa, wait a minute. Am I even is that it for me? You know, like you know, at that I mean, we 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 should all have these problems. Uh <laughs> if you're Spielberg. But but or it could be something as as you know, as what you're going through, which or went through, which is this kind of negative voice that keeps back in the head. And I know everyone listening right now, at one point or another, has that kind of negative voice saying you're not good enough, imposter syndrome you've got, uh, they're going to figure me out. Uh, and then it just starts building and building. To, and you literally had something, you had a physical representation of what you couldn't do. And it was sitting on a shelf. So it was even yeah. worse for you. It wasn't the concept because a lot of filmmakers think like I did. Like I was like, oh, it's it's the feature film that I, I can never do. And I talked my, my way out of it. You literally had a finished product on your shelf or close to finished product on your shelf. And you were afraid to tackle it again. Is that fair yeah. to say? Yeah, absolutely. It, it, it's, it, it's just, it's weird. It's so, it's so strange because generally as a, at, the, at this point in my life, like I had sporadic jobs. I've, I've never really managed to have like a full time job. I've worked mm-hmm. in bars. I've worked as a freelancer. You know how it is. Like mm-hmm. you, you mm-hmm. take you hustle. Can. Yeah, yeah, I hustle. <laughs> you hustle. Um, yeah, but it was just it was just this shield, and it was absolutely ridiculous. Because as a person, generally, I'll I'll do anything in terms of uh, an adrenaline rush. I'll just jump out, and you know, I'll go to parties. I'll I'll contact people that. I probably shouldn't be contacting it at my stage of my career or something. Just, you know, walk in the door, ball swinging, you know? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, yeah, but I just couldn't work out why I didn't want to touch this, this film just sitting there. And it was such a, I mean, it was such a small thing. It was a short film for crying out loud. Like, mm-hmm. why couldn't I do that? 
<sighs> it gets better. It gets better in the end, folks. I'm going to tell you how to get over this. <laughs> so, okay, so well, you've been, so this and this lasted for three to four years. Four years. Four uh, it years. It actually got worse. Yeah, it actually got worse after Norway. So, so uh, what happened? So, girl- why did it get worse in generally just your own personal life? Yeah, yeah. Basically, uh, I ended up coming back to the UK, um, where you know I fell into depression and all that stuff. Like, mm, uh, I know that started going. eating. Mm-hmm. Like, the food in England's not as good as Norway. Like, a lot of fast food here, a lot of fatty foods, a lot of things that are going to make you feel really bad inside. Mm-hmm. Uh, um, yeah. So you know, again, going into probably ended up working at a factory. Um, yeah, I couldn't, you know, the kind of jobs that just were making me really down, like really uncreative jobs, um, basically being a robot. Oh, um, and that's, and that is absolute torture for a creative, yeah. like doing this kind of monoton- monotonous kind of work for a filmmaker or a creative is brutal. And, and I, I was editing for a long time. And I had, I, I, I had two full-time, I've only had two full-time editing jobs ever in my life, like not freelance. And I was promptly fired from both. And I'm very proud of my firings uh, because I just couldn't handle that kind of like in and out. And yeah, mine's was even still a little creative, but if it was like doing promos for the same show, which was a horrible show again and again and again, it was, it was brutal. It was brutal, brutal. And I would, th- I went through that myself during some of the toughest, toughest times of my life as well. So I feel you, brother. I feel you. No, oh, thanks, man. The thing is, like, I mean, I can say all these things, but at the end of the day, like, it wasn't, it wasn't as bad as I could make it out to seem. Like, I, you know, I had a roof over my head, mm-hmm. which, which I can't complain about. I, I, I may have been eating terrible foods for, <laughs> for like a, a quid at Burger King and stuff like that, but you know, I was, I was still alive. You know. You're right. And even through all this, um, the like down period of my life, there's still a throb inside the back, a throbbing notion in the back of my mind saying that film's not done and you're a filmmaker. Now, even, Mm. even if the film's not done yet, my brain is still telling me you're a filmmaker. You may not be doing it right now, but you are a filmmaker. There's only one way out of this and that's to make films or die trying. The funny thing is that, this is the brutal nature of our own mind. Our own mind will tell us that you're a filmmaker, but yet beat you down for being a filmmaker. And that is, it's, it's, I, I always use the example of uh, the, the cake at the end of the dinner. If you have a huge dinner and you're stuffed, you've ever had that dinner that you've just had, you're stuffed, you like literally unbutton your belt. You're like, I can't, I just can't even anymore. Then someone busts out some cheesecake or a cake or a pie and then you're like, well, your mind tells you, go ahead. Just, it, it's all right. You will work out a little bit more tomorrow. Go ahead. And you eat the pie. So it's gluttonous. You're eating this piece of pie, right? And then later that evening, you're taking your clothes off in front of the mirror. And what does that same brain tell you? You fat uh. pig. I can't <laughs> believe you ate that. It's like literally the same voice. You're like, mother F it. Come on. Like, are you kidding me? And that's exa- it sounds exactly what you're saying. You're like, Oh, you can't do that movie. Oh, you can't do this. Just a short, just a short. And like you've built this monster up that is this this short film. But yet your mind's still saying, hey, but don't forget you're a filmmaker. I'm, <laughs> you're like, go yeah, F. Exactly. Go it's F so yourself, dude. Like, like go F yourself. Yeah. Come on. Enough already. <laughs> Doesn't matter if you have to crawl through the mud for miles and miles and miles or you got to climb a mountain one step at a time. You're going to get there. <laughs> like, yeah. It- it is a sick. Yeah. It is a sickness, man. We are. We have a sickness. It's. It's this. It, I mean, we, I talk about it being like herpes, but all honesty, <laughs> it is a sickness. It is something that we have that we cannot get rid of, and once it's in there, it's very, very, very difficult to, to leave, and 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 honestly, it shouldn't leave. If you have a, a burning sen- feel, a burning sensation, a burning feeling. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I could not help. That was a Freudian slip. If you have a, a oh. burning, uh, a burning fire inside of you to do something you've got to go out and do it this is too short of a life not to to play it safe like why in hell first of all if you're in the film business you ain't playing it safe buddy you know that's just not gonna happen that's just not the way this business works so i'm i'm 
I'm fascinated by your story, but it's a story that I've walked my, this is a path I've walked myself and just different flavors of it. That's all. You see, hearing that from you, it just, to me, it just means that I'm on the right path. I'm walking in the right direction. It doesn't matter where I am, whether I'm at the beginning of the line or I've mm -hmm. got a thousand billion miles to go. Mm -hmm. it means I'm still walking in the direction. I feel like uh, Lloyd from Dumb and Dumber, where, where, where she's <laughs> there's like, still there's, a chance. there's only yeah, one in a billion, more like one in a billion. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> that is basically the meme for every independent filmmaker ever. <laughs> we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. It is, yeah. Because um, it's okay. like oh, yeah, it's like sun like Sundance. You mean there's a chance? Yes, of course there's a chance. You and twenty thousand other filmmakers were submitting this year. <laughs> oh, okay. go oh, ahead. Well, so, okay. so continue, sir. So, all right, all right. So basically, the factory stuff um, happened, and then my girlfriend she moved back to Sweden, um, and I <laughs> couldn't afford the flat, so I had to move back in with my parents. And as a thirty year old man, Ooh. that's that's like that is the ground right there. Like, that's, that, that is, mm -hmm. I failed. Rock yeah, bottom, yeah, as, as, as low as you can go. Yeah, got it. As low as you can go. Bottom. Mm -hmm. um, I got a job working at a uh, meat delivery company. <laughs> it, sounds fa um, it sounds like fascinating work, sir. Yeah, yeah. Well, actually, you know, it's, really, it's actually quite, quite funny because um, I, I used to have to, like, walk around this white shirt and I wrote on the front, free hugs, and there is nothing better <laughs> Than walking down one of the streets in England that's known for like the most murders in that city, <laughs> wearing a shirt saying "Free Hugs Covered in Blood." Oh, um, that's brilliant! Yeah. That's a that's a short film right there. I have to tell you, that is a short <laughs> film out there right there. You Fun know, in fact, I was a vegetarian at the time as well. <laughs> <laughs> He's even. Oh my gosh, you're you're a meat delivery guy, and you're like vegetarian. Oh, yeah. <laughs> God, the universe is cruel. It's cruel. <laughs> it's cruel. You know what I find funny, though, as I'm listening to your story, it sounds to me that most of the things that are happening to you, not all, but most, are self done. Like you're doing yeah. it to yourself. Like, sure, there's Absolutely. external there's external issues. Sure. How you deal with those external issues is the only thing you have control over. But you are your worst enemy. You are, mm. you know, like you're saying, oh, I'm a filmmaker. I had to get a job at a factory. I had to do this. Where someone else might have thought, you know what, I got to hustle another way to make some money. How can I make money in the film business somehow? Can I do this or can I go do that? Or, you know, whatever that might be. And trust me, it took me years of doing that too. Like, dude, I got so low. I'm going to tell you, I don't even think I've ever said this before publicly. After that whole mob thing, I got so low in my place. And this is, I think this is, it was close to rock bottom. It wasn't rock bottom yet. Cause I hadn't filed for bank. I was about to file for bankruptcy. That's when it was, that was, that was the bottom for me. But I was, I was weeks away from that. I went to Hollywood video with an application to become a video store clerk again. When I would have been in the business at that point for almost, ten, almost 10 years making a living as an editor. And I, I was so defeated that I literally went to Hollywood Video and, and put my application in as a video store clerk back in the day. And, and then they said, how much do you make an hour? I'm like, oh, I've been making like 50 bucks an hour for, for the last 10 years. And the manager just looked at me. He's like, yeah, I don't think this is going to work out for you, buddy. <laughs> so oh. it was brutal. But, I, but I feel you. I feel you. We all did stuff that, you know, but that was all mental, though. It was completely my own doing. I could have easily yeah. broken my way out of that if I had the strength to or had to guide someone to guide me out of it. Uh, I... Yeah, I know how it is. But the nice thing about hitting that rock bottom is that you know where the rock bottom is. You can't go anywhere. You can't really go lower. You can go. You you can only go up. You can, you know, you've got something to jump off of now, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's, so that's you get, the nice thing about it. So you get down. So now we're, we're, where are we? We're like at year four at this we're, point? Huh? We're at year yeah, four? Yeah, we're, we're, well, we're at three and a half at this point, actually. Okay. Three and a half, I'd say. Um, yeah, so this is, so this is the point I discovered your podcast actually. Okay. <laughs> so basically, uh, I started, I started listening to, you know, one or two episodes of Indie Film Hustle and it was, 
And it was all these stories, essentially, about people that, you know, were like me, didn't have any money, didn't have ha- have anything to go on, but still kept this creative dream going. Mm. Kept that dream alive. Hey. <laughs> yeah. I'll just throw that in there. That's awesome. I'm going to try and make you blush good, sir, by the end of this. <laughs> I appreciate uh, that. <laughs> That's yeah. awesome. So. So, yeah, so at this point, I, you know, I started listening to all these small things about distribution, little bits like that. Um, what what I could do just to just to get off the ground to actually start making some money. And it was it was also some of the small podcasts you did where uh, where you were talking about, you know, stop crying about it. Like <laughs> you are you are the the leader of your own destiny. You are the person that has to pull yourself off the ground. You are the no one's going to do anything for you. You know, apologize yeah. to no one. Do what you need to do to get where you want to be. The tough love episode. The tough love. Yeah, the tough love to, to, to you know. And I, I'm living in an environment where everyone's saying, um, you know, all that film stuff is nonsense. Go out and get a real job, things like that. Like, I had so many exterior factors slamming down on me saying, this is not for you. Like, you've been trying this thing in Norway for ages. You've been trying this thing your whole life. Why don't you just give up? <laughs> like, like. And because of you and because of the podcast, it's, and, and not just this podcast, like I started reading, like as soon as I started listening to the podcast, hell, I went and bought a copy of Rebel Without a Crew. Mm-hmm. Probably one of the best books I've ever read helped me, you know, unendingly. I was actually supposed to go for medical testing this month. Nice. <laughs> um, yeah, but um, I failed on one of the early screeners. Um, and yeah. So they wouldn't let me go, but hey, that's one for the future. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to get the money together to make a film that way. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. But you start. But you start listening to the podcast. You start reading books. You start educating yourself. You start slowly pulling yourself out. Yeah. The, before that, I wasn't exercising either. I started eating healthier. I started going to the gym all the mm-hmm. time, whenever mm-hmm. I could. And the thing is that when you start doing all those small things, like even if it's just a little bit a day, like just being a little bit creative a day or just or just doing something good for yourself, like getting your endorphins up naturally, not through some fast food or or drinking or whatever it is, it starts to snowball. All the good things mm-hmm. will snowball and then you'll start doing them naturally and you'll want to do them more and it will bring you out of some kind of little slump that you've been in. Yeah. Um, the one the one thing I, I wanted to kind of point out that you said, which I think was really important, is when you said the statement that your brain was telling you or your mind was telling you, you've been trying to do this for years now. It's not working. What are you doing? You know, Oh you no, need- that wasn't my mind. <laughs> That, that, that wasn't my mind. That was, that was my father. <laughs> <laughs> but your mind but you had a conversation with yourself, something in regards to your dream and not being able to achieve it. Hmm. I remember I, I have to go back and listen. But anyway, regardless of that, you were hearing that from exterior or interior conversation. It was coming from your dad or it was coming – trust me, my dad said the same thing. Um, yeah, yeah. But I, I think want, that's, a, that's a story with most creatives, I think. So. Yeah, and I, and I want everyone listening – I'm sure everyone listening has had that person in their life or has th- that conversation with themselves at one point or another. And I want you to be very clear that we all go through it. And yeah. that's a test. It's a test to get through it and you have to get out of it. And it's just part of the path of the, the filmmaking path. It's just part of what we have to walk. Uh, you know, in, unless you get a lottery ticket at the very beginning of your career, like Robert did, Robert Rodriguez did, you know, that's a one in a billion chance. Uh, generally speaking, what we, you and I are talking about right now is pretty much the majority of what filmmakers go through. Would you agree? Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think it was, uh, it's in Lloyd Kaufman's book, uh, Trey mm-hmm. Parker says, um, if you want to make money on the in the film industry, you may as well just go put all your money on 31 Black or something, because right. the chances are probably going to be the same. Well, as they say, what's, the, what's that old saying? They say, if you want to create a small fortune in the film industry, start with a large fortune. <laughs> I haven't heard that one, but yeah. <laughs> oh, so true. Yeah. Oh God. So you were God, able man, to. It's really. You were able to come gone. out of it. Sorry. So you, so you were able to pull yourself out little by little, doing little things every day, 
uh, and just kind of building on that. So you're like literally, I look at it in my mind, I'm creating, you're, you're basically Batman at the bottom of that pit. In mm. Batman, uh, whatever, and the Dark Knight Rises, you know, that mm. Bane threw him into that pit. And slowly but surely, he's trying to figure out step by step how to get to that rope, how to get out there. And between the podcast, between the books, between you taking care of yourself, between you eating, being creative a little bit every day, these are the stepping stones that are slowly allowing you to start seeing the light. Is that fair to say? Yeah, absolutely. It's just it's a little by little every day. It's not a it's like it's not a sprint. It's not like some kind of aha moment. Like the light's not gonna you know shoot through your curtains or something in a dramatic form. It's it's about the little things. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Building those little things. And then you finally, and you finally start getting out, and then you start looking over on the shelf. I'm assuming. Yeah, I start looking over the shelf. I find that hard drive. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I find that hard drive. Um, I managed to get a. Actually, that's one thing I missed out earlier. Um, I did edit it myself, but my computer broke at the time. <laughs> so why, why, why wouldn't it? Of course it did. Yeah, yeah. That was one thing I missed out from the past. But still, you know, it's a small thing that shouldn't have mattered. But whatever it was, but. I go, I fix the computer. I fix the computer situation at this point in my life now where I was actually able to start editing it again. I started, I brought that film out and I said to myself, I am not leaving this goddamn thing until it's finished. I don't care what happens in my life. If everything else gets ruined, I'm going to say that I did this film. I finished it no matter what. And honestly, that's a crazy, crazy way of thinking. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone, but I pushed myself to the point where I got this done. Um, I learned a bunch of new things to get it done. Like I never colored before. That was one thing. Um, mm. You know, downloaded DaVinci, yeah, learned to do that. I never actually got the coloring right. So I asked a friend to do it. Um, and he, he, um, he worked on, what did he work on? Fantastic, Be- uh, Fantastic Beasts, mm-hmm. a Harry Potter film. Um, and he tried to do it, uh, but he never got time. So I had the thing sitting with him for three months. So that extended the time. But at this point, I didn't even care about the, how long it was taking. The, mm-hmm. the only thing to me was that it's going to get finished. Mm-hmm. Like I thought about it every day. <laughs> right. It was, just, yeah. it, it was the elephant in the room. Oh, yeah. It was the elephant in the room. But I was no longer going to let that elephant sit on my shelf. You know, mm-hmm. I, <laughs> I don't know if that's the right analogy. I was going to fight the elephant, but you know, you no, get you, the just, idea. you 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 stop ignoring it and you start yeah. saying like, okay, it's let's take let's take this guy out for a spin, you know, and it might be a slow process, but we're moving. It's a step by step process. Yeah, like I said, even if it's a mountain, you get up it one step at a time. You just you just got to keep saying that you're going in the right direction. Don't look back. Don't let anyone distract you. You, long, as long as you're going in the right direction, you're doing the right thing. It may take a day. It may take 10 years. Yeah, as long as you're going in the right direction. Um, yeah, but anyway, I, have, I, 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 the, I found another colorist who actually did it within a week um, on Instagram. Her name was Emily. The, I think her Instagram tag is Emily the Colorist. Um, yeah, but we, only, we communicated through Instagram. And she helped me out. She did an amazing job. And I, I'd done all the sound design myself. I uh, did most of the, mostly I did all the after effects myself. I learned how to do that. Um, Excellent. Yeah, just just to get this thing done. And yeah, then it was done. And then, <laughs> and then, and then I had, then you had something. It was done. Now it's now it's time to spend money on uh, submissions. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, but that was the thing. I you know it's really weird because I stopped drinking. Um, drinking soft drinks so i had like one can of dr pepper in my car ready to crack open when i finished <laughs> finish the uh, film. it's such a sad story it's with so- the dr pepper but like that <laughs> that was like my reward you know <laughs> what man but that's but those are the four sm- year process that is a small little thing man it is so it's so important to 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 take care of yourself, man and to treat yourself every once in a while man if that's a can of dr pepper at the end of it Brother, enjoy your Dr. Pepper, man. It doesn't it was matter. The best Dr. Pepper I've ever had. I'm sure oh it was. God. I'm yeah. sure. I'm sure it was. You know, yeah. I, listening to your story, man, and and I, I'm assuming at this point, you you want you, your goal was to finish the movie. I'm assuming there's no lofty goals 
Um, oh, or, Christ. Uh, well, I'm sure. Uh, sorry, so what, is, what are the lofty goals? Tell me. Well, let's go even bigger because the film um, is now going to a bunch of festivals. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm super happy about that. I spent a lot of money on uh, festival entries. So mm -hmm. what actually what I would do was um, I'd try and select small town festivals, with really cheap, um, like first time festivals or ones with really cheap uh, submission mm -hmm. fees. So I could mm -hmm. submit to those rather than going in with the big ones and just spending a ton of money, which I didn't have, obviously. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, it's worked out really well. We got into one uh, Oxeca in uh, like middle Mexico. Nice. Yeah, I know that one. Yeah, yeah I've been in that one. That's yeah, cool. yeah. So we're, we're going to there in October and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I mean, this is to me, that's the big festival. And it's nice to see that this this four years of kind of uh, of a journey has actually paid off to something. And while we're going to be there, we're going to be pitching. Uh, obviously, we've got a feature plan now. Uh, we got a sequel to the short planned. Um, Good for you. We, yes. Yeah, since then, we made a documentary uh, called "Just Another Toy Story" uh, about Thai orphans. Um, I've set my company up in the UK and in Norway, uh, so so obviously we can start making money from small videos and things wherever we can to start the process off and actually start our lives going. <laughs> so you started building. So, so you're building. You're building a lifestyle and a company and a career for yourself, basically. Absolutely. Uh, I've been doing freelance work at the BBC now as well. That's it's lovely to tell people that you work for the BBC as well. Um, it's a lovely company. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> but it was a dark. But it was a dark. It was a dark journey out of the woods, if you will, and it, it, out of that hole. Mm, yeah, it was a dark journey. It was a long journey, but it was, it was one that kind of um, is definitely a crucible for me. It may not have been so extreme or anything, and and at the end of the day, the story is not. It doesn't have like this massive explosion of an ending. Like you finish the film, it was. It would be like kind of. Uh, that's pretty uh, explosive you know, to so me, brother. I hate to tell you, that's pretty <laughs> explosive to me. You know how many you know how many filmmakers I talk to, who still have that movie on the shelf, or even worse. They still have the idea. They haven't even written the script oh. yet. I mean, That's the thing. Yeah. You, you go. Sorry. No, no, no. You go. Go ahead. Oh, uh, no. But that's the thing. Like most creative people, you will you will bleed ideas. You, you'll you probably come up with like 10, 10 ideas a day. I know I do. Mm -hmm. And it's all about the execution of it. So get that idea. Write it down. See what the best one. See what the easiest one to make at that current time is with the equipment and the things you have. I made a short about a T-Rex with my brother in the yard the other day. It came out great. Loved it. But <laughs> we just did it. Yeah, That's we just awesome. did it. It's, 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 it's about doing the, the, the creative things that you enjoy and having that finished product, even if it's like a, 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 small, a small, silly little thing like I just did in the yard with my brother. Mm -hmm. Like, it's, it, it's done and, and you have something to show and you're happy about it. And, it, it just it just fuels that creativity and that happiness. Just constantly making something, w w without question. And you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you something that this business, in general, this this path that we've chosen, the filmmaking path, will test you multiple times throughout your your life, and it will continuously beat you, and will throw obstacles in front of yourself, throw in front obstacles in front of you on your path, and will. Just you know, you're walking all of all of a sudden, and you'll just get a right hook out of nowhere, or you'll get a gut punch, and then sometimes you'll you'll really stumble, and then you're in a hole for four years. Uh, I was in a hole for about three. It took me about two three years before I could come back out, even look at anything in the film business uh, after my my uh, my pummeling with the mob. <laughs> so it, it, I get it. I get it. And I think everyone listening, really, you have to understand that you, you will be tested by the universe, by this business, by whatever you want to call it, but you will be tested multiple times. And it honestly is kind of like, uh, it, it's kind of like being a forged in fire because the film business is so difficult and is so tough uh, to just be able to make a living in, especially in today's world with so many people, you know, we're talking about tens of thousands of people jumping into this business a day uh, in one way, shape or form. It's so difficult now that if you don't have that rhino skin, if you don't have the shrapnel, if you don't have the scarring 
um, or the or the scorch marks on your back uh, of of walking that path, uh, it, it, you won't make it. I think I think you should look for them because it, it will harden you and make you a better filmmaker. You know, I've had the pleasure of speaking to many of these, you know, these high end people in the business, you know, you've listened to the podcast, you know, that I've talked to a lot of these filmmakers who, who are at a very top, you know, at the very top level of their game. Oh, you want to talk about imposter syndrome? Yeah. Like right now I'm like, Oh my God, I'm just like some small guy that made a short and you've got the people you've got on this show are absolutely incredible. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Like, right. And that's what I love about this show is because I can choose who the hell I want on the show and the kind of stories and the kind of knowledge and information and inspiration that I can put out there. And, you know, on the on paper, this doesn't make any sense. Why would I have a short filmmaker who didn't have their film made or had a, t- had a tough time getting their movie made and it's out and it's, you know, and it didn't win an Oscar. It, you know, it didn't do a whole thing. It didn't make a million dollars from it. But this this process, this journey is special and it's something that no other podcast talks about in, in this way it's at least to my knowledge and and it's information that needs to be put out there because i want people to know that this is what we all go through that's why rebel I'm- without a crew is such a great book because it was the first book to ever kind of make you feel like oh there's somebody else out there mind you his story is quite you know, yes. magical lottery ticket. It's lottery, lottery t- ticket. Where shooting yeah. for the mob, I always call it the companion piece for a broad crew because it's the complete opposite direction <laughs> of where it's the anti lottery ticket mo- book uh, and story because it's the reality. But it was the first book that kind of, you know, made me go, "Oh, I'm not alone," and that's why I wanted the, I wanted you on the show. It's just so important to put this kind of stuff out there because obviously it affected you. And I was just talking you know, doing some, t- some tough love episodes and it really hit you. I could only yeah, imagine, yeah, yeah, I could only imagine if you would have heard this podcast by somebody else in this situation, wh- well, what effect I, I, would happen to you? I hope, yeah, I, I hope someone listens to this and thinks like, no matter how low you get, like a 30 year old guy living with his parents, like, like how low, like, I mean, that was rock bottom for me. Now I'm, I'm finally, you know, on my way again, uh, back out going, going back to Norway where, absolutely love it um yeah but even if you get that low like you will still have that spark like because you'll know it's there if it gets extinguished you'll you'll probably be quite i actually saying that i have had a a friend who was an editor for a long time and we actually had a we had a company in norway and i worked for him called uh, jackfruit mm-hmm. and uh he he basically um he was an editor and his he he just got so with the with all the marketing videos and things like that he just got burnt out with the whole thing he mm-hmm. wasn't creative anymore he didn't like it and yeah his i don't know if his flame ever got extinguished but i rang him up a few days uh like like he almost lost his house things like that mm-hmm. but i rang him up a few days ago to tell him about the film because you know i want to promote it and he said to me like yeah i stopped i stopped with the filmmaking i stopped with the um with with um editing and everything and I've never been happier. He works in a factory in Norway, but he makes a load of money doing it. Um, he's secure. He's got a wife and two kids, and he's he's actually happy. So there's that temptation as well that you could be happy, but I I, I wouldn't want to be. I want to be a filmmaker, <laughs> regardless. But, you know, but at the end of the day, those tests that I talked about earlier, that's really what it is. It's a test. Like, is this for you? Like. Are you going to come out the other end? It's okay if it's not. Like, you know, I, you know, if I go out for an NFL football team, I'm probably not going to do real well. It, not <laughs> everything is for everybody, you know, and it's okay. And it's not, oh, I'm going to quit or I'm not going to give up. You know what? There's people who want to, you know, sing songs or play the guitar or, you know, be a screenwriter or – you know, be a filmmaker or be a painter or a sculptor or anything in the arts or anything anywhere in any kind of, you know, I want to be an entrepreneur until they really, until, you know, like Mike Tyson says, everyone's got a plan till you get punched in the face. And (laughs) and it's, it's extremely true. So it's not for everybody, but those tests are there to, to really 
make you realize if you really want to do this. Your journey and the path you had to walk was your proof to yourself that you're like, well, I went through all of this and I still want to do it. I had that happen. And it happened, it happened twice to me, two big times. One was the mob. The second time I'd left the business and I opened up an olive oil store for God's sakes. Uh, and I was gone from the business for almost three years, but I never stopped. It never stopped. And then I opened up Indie Film Hustle and the rest is history. But it never, I never, it never was ever extinguished ever, but it was always quiet. It was always uh, in, in, rem- in remission. <laughs> if you will. The way, the way I look at all these terrible stories that you hear about people like trying to pull themselves up from the thing, like I don't think of them as like, like I don't look at this, that part of my life as a bad thing. No, I look at it. It's a, it's a story. It's a, it's yet another story that I can use to put into my creativity without I can, I can. without Darth Vader Luke Skywalker cannot become Luke Skywalker exactly you need to go through shit you need to go through stuff in order to to test yourself to see what you're made of you're only going to get stronger if you lift heavier weights and it's not pleasurable yeah. am i wrong it's not pleasurable to lift more it hurts you're tearing down your muscles. You're tearing down your body when you do that. But it rebuilds stronger. And that is the perfect analogy for this business. Every time something bad happens to you, every time a challenge happens or your project falls apart or something, it is just another way for you to get stronger and get that rhinoceros hide up and running. I'll give you a great example from recently, actually. Um, <laughs> actually, t- turning like a negative thing into a really positive one. So, it, like most, you know, I'll go and I'll write in a cafe. Mm-hmm. Mine, it's Cafe Nero, like we all do. Sure. Um, yeah. So I'm sitting there. I got my headphones on. I listen to white noise sometimes when I write. Me really too. good. Mm-hmm. Really. Uh, yeah. I recommend it for anyone that struggles to concentrate. Um, yeah, so I'm typing away and then some woman starts talking to me and I'm like, okay, sorry, take my headphones off. And she said, I think it's disgusting what you do. And you know, it's me. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, okay, it's my fly open. Um, oh, usually it takes like a few sentences before someone says something like that to me. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, she's like, how you come in this cafe and you don't buy anything and you sit here and use like your office. Fair enough, there wasn't anything on my table because, you know, the cafe staff are really good and they cleaned everything up, all the stuff I've been buying over the day. Mm -hmm. I explained this to the woman and uh, she didn't want to, uh, she she basically seemed like she wanted to argue. Uh, I called one of the baristas over, said, how often do I come here? He's like, oh, you're here every day buying uh, buying stuff and working. Yes, we like you. Mm -hmm. Um, And the woman got angry at this and stormed out, said she was going to complain. So what (laughs) I did... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, yeah. So what I did instead was I, I wrote a compliment letter to the cafe saying how nice they are and how good they are, and that I come there every day to write, and it's it's just it's helping my creativity, it's helping me get my film company off the ground, it's doing it's doing amazing things for me. Mm-hmm. And um, anyway, this letter, then <laughs> a buddy of mine is a journalist, and he got wind of this letter, and he published it mm-hmm. uh, in the local paper. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So in this letter, not only do I come off like I was actually trying to be a nice guy and do the right thing, mm-hmm. it's also spread all over the paper now, my film and everything possibly about it, links to the trailer, whatever I can get in there. So I in a, in basically because this woman had basically not liked me sitting there typing, it's actually helped my film get promoted <laughs> and uh, get the trailer to the eyes of more people. So this is an example of turning negativity into something positive. <laughs> isn't, isn't it funny how the world works? Isn't it funny how the universe works? I mean, if you wouldn't, if you would have been sitting at home wallowing about why my life sucks, as opposed to getting up off your ass, going to the coffee shop every day and being creative in a small way, then, you know, you're not writing an Oscar winning script. You know, you're just in a small way because of that consistency that you showed up one day, this crazy woman <laughs> shows up yeah. and because of her craziness, you have a wonderful free marketing opportunity. Absolutely. Trying to like every, every negative thing you see, like there, there will be some positivity and there will be something that you can do to turn that, that negative thing into something positive. 
anything almost. Yeah, and, and, but my point, uh, my point is that because you just kept grinding and kept oh, yeah. moving, and you're actually doing something for yourself, and you're actually actively working towards your dream, an assistance came, a wind of help came. But if you would have been sitting at home, it wouldn't have been there. And I hope that's what somebody listening right now gets from that comment is that you've got to get up off your butt and you've got to do something every day. It's kind of like what um, Stephen Pressfield says in The War of Art, which is a great book about resistance and, and things stopping you creatively. Have you read that book? No, I haven't actually. You've got to read The War of Art. Every creative ever needs to read The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield. It is a short book, but it is, it'll change your life. We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. And in the book, he says that we have something called resistance. And that resistance is the, oh, don't get up in the morning early to go to the gym. Oh, don't, don't go sit down to write now. Oh, you, why don't you just, you know, you go to Facebook first. Or that, that thing that stops you from being creative that is called resistance in his world. And it's so true because we all go through it. We all have that inner dialogue. It's like, oh, well, maybe I'll just, let me just watch this YouTube video. And then five hours later, <laughs> you've, got, you've gotten nothing done. It, it's our job to break through resistance. It's our job to go out there and do something little every single day, that discipline to, to get us closer to our dreams. And it, like you said earlier, it's a, long, it's a long game, man. It's definitely a long game. Now, I want to ask you, man, what was the biggest lesson you learned from this entire process? <laughs> um, honestly, uh, I can't wait. I wrote all this down. I knew you were going to ask me, so <laughs> I prepared for this. <laughs> so basically, the lesson I would say is just don't stop. Don't back down and don't give up and bleed if you have to. Like, just don't stop. Get up every morning. Always do, do and don't stop doing it. It's kind of like uh, what Rocky Balboa said in uh, in the movie Rocky Balboa. It's, it's a great inspirational speech that Stallone wrote, which was, life is going to hit you harder than you ever know, and it will bring you down to your knees. But what makes a champion or what makes you go forward is it's, it's how hard you get hit and keep moving forward. Because you're going to get hit. It's just about how hard... You can get hit and keep moving forward, and that is success. That's how. That's that was what a beautiful rendition of it. <laughs> I, it's a horrible rendition of it, but you know what I mean. Um, <laughs> it, it's a. It's it's horrible. He does it so much better. Um, but uh, Sly, if you're listening, anytime you want to be on the show, open, open, open invitation, sir. Uh, but but seriously, it's that's what it's about. It's about seeing, like how hard can you get hit and you're dropped down to your knees. And you hit and you move in at 30 with your parents. Can you keep going forward or are you going to give up? And that's an analogy for life, essentially. Yeah, it's just, yeah, basically you, you've got to get out of that place. That's, that's, that's your goal for that part. Anyway, um, I would say comfort is the bane of um, <sighs> progress. Yeah. I would, that, that would be how I would put it. Comfort is the bane of progress. You've got to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. There's yeah, no, you exactly. know, no, no, that's why I take cold showers every single day. I never take a warm shower anymore. I can't take a hot shower anymore because really? I've got, I can't, I have been taking cold showers now for three months. And one day my wife left the hot water on and it hit me. I was like, Oh, this is horrible. And I, I, sl I turned it off. My body is now accustomed to freezing cold showers. And it's, there's reasons to do it. There's health reasons and physiologi physiological, I can't say the word, reasons, um, physical reasons to do it as well. But for me, it was about breaking through my own mindset of what I, I had to get uncomfortable with it. And trust me, those first few weeks, brutal, brutal, brutal. Because everything your mind tells you about not taking a cold shower is exactly everything it tells you about not making that movie, about not writing that script, about not doing going to the gym, about everything that is going to better you. That's when your mind's stopping you. Why? Because it's out of its own comfort zone. It wants to it wants to stay in that little construct in that little box that you've created until you eventually can break through it. And now taking cold showers is my new comfort zone. So writing five pages a day should be your comfort zone that you're aiming for. Making a feature or two a year or making 10 shorts a year 
that should be your comfort zone. And that takes time to break through. But try a cold shower, brother. Do it for like a month. Do it 30 days and see what happens. I'm it, totally going to do that. <laughs> it's, it's the cheapest cup of coffee you'll ever have in your life. You want to talk about waking up in the morning? Ooh. <laughs> It's a lot easier to do it in the summer than in the winter. I can tell you that much. <laughs> oh, we go. Yeah, we're just coming out of the summer here. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. Saying that, I'm moving back to Norway. Cold showers there. That's an interesting. Go for it, man. You know, do, I'm telling you, everyone listening, try a cold shower. Do a whole research on it. Win, Win Hoff, Win Hoff method is another guy who just takes cold showers constantly. And, and you, 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 there's a whole thing about that. I could do a whole episode on just cold yeah, showers. It's like, it's like, uh, it's in the, Stoic, uh, the Stoic uh, guidebook, isn't it? Or um, yeah, part of Stoicism. Yeah, it is. In the morning, where the uh, yeah, like uh, Ryan Holiday's book, "The Obstacle Is Is the Way," which is such a great book, and you should read that book as well. "The Obstacle Is the Way," and as opposed to an obstacle or a problem being a problem, it's no. That's what's going to get you to where you need to go. It's it's a great great way to look at it. Now, what advice would you give a filmmaker wanting to break into the business today? Well, that's the thing. I'm I'm still breaking in myself. So, uh, <laughs> but it would be it would be um, destroy your social media, like use it and abuse it um, to get your material out there and find people. Mm-hmm. Um, don't be scared to ring people up who you think are uh, are up there in the industry. You've you've got to pester people. You've got to you've got to be there. You've got to take every every chance you can get. If you get the email of someone high up and you want to get a job make sure you email them don't be afraid to do it uh obviously when it, when it yeah yeah <laughs> um and make as many films as you possibly can to show them that you you are have the ability lloyd kaufman what was it uh quantity over quality i think he said mm-hmm. so you know and yeah you will learn from making those mistakes on a constant basis and you will constantly improve basically now, just don't be scared yeah, right. Easier said than done, right? But yeah, yes. it's like, yeah, just don't be scared. Just go out there and do it. It's, I get it. I get I mean, it. <laughs> this is my moment to say something inspiring, but I'm like, yeah, <laughs> man, just don't be scared. It's all good. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be okay. I promise you it'll be okay. Now, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? It's really weird. I, I would have, you know, I, I would have said like well, Lloyd Kaufman or Rebel Wack or something like that. But it's basically uh, someone gave me this book that was called – uh, I can make you rich. Now it's yeah, the, yeah. It, Rami yeah. Sati. Yeah, yeah. No, no, it's uh, it's actually by this guy called Felix Dennis, the one I'm I'm talking oh, about. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. yeah. So I thought it I thought it was going to be like you know one of those typical uh, really bad self help books that you you know you buy for a dollar or something in a bargain bin, mm-hmm. but this one was really good because it was the anti self help book. Basically, this guy. Um, was absolutely relentless in his kind of mission to to make money and you can apply it essentially to filmmaking as well and he and it's about kind of that obsession that you you constantly have and it's okay to have that obsession but understand that other things are going to fall by the wayside and you can have it all if you want and it is possible but your main goal may actually take the place of other things in your life but having that is okay. It's okay to do that. Got it. Now, what is the biggest fear you had to overcome to make oh. uh, to make this film specifically and finish this? By film? the sounds, by the sounds of it, picking a hard drive up off a dusty shelf. But uh. <laughs> <laughs> just pick the damn hard drive up, man. Yeah, Come on. Yeah, yeah. Um, again, it was don't be afraid to talk to people, to to ask people for help, to ask people for advice, uh, to say to people um, who are basically fueling the doubt in your mind, like, no, I'm going to do this. I'm not scared of doing it. Stop saying all these silly things to me. I, you know, I don't care what you say. It's it's about standing up for your for yourself to yourself, essentially, like not doubting yourself. That is the the hardest hump to get over. Now, three of your favorite films of all time. <laughs> um, so I would say Once. Uh, yeah, yeah by great John movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because that was the first film that showed me, um, you know, a beautiful film doesn't have to look beautiful, if you know mm-hmm. what I mean. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was I, you know, I loved it. It was, yeah, it really hit my heart chords. Um, Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. Mm-hmm. Uh, awesome. Wes Anderson. Yeah, it's just a happy. Oh, I just love that film. Um, like, actually, have you ever seen? You know, it's a spoof, right? 
Of of which movie? Oh yeah, of Jacques Cousteau. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have yeah. you seen the original? No, but I know who Jacques Cousteau is. But no, I haven't yeah, seen yeah. the original. Well, it's the because it's absolutely hilarious because the original was like I think it was made in the fifties and they had this whole uh, different take on environmentalism back then. So they <laughs> the way so there's like a bunch of jokes that seem really random in uh, the Life Aquatic. Mm-hmm. And then when you watch The Silent World, you understand and how funny it actually is. Um, there's, so in the, in the Silent World, the way they take a census of a reef is, well, they use dynamite. <laughs> they blow it up. <laughs> and then they put all the fish in specimen jars. You know, these guys are environmentalists. <laughs> <laughs> That's genius. Yes, yes. <laughs> and there's, there's just this one line that I didn't get the first time I saw it. But after seeing that film, I saw The Life Aquatic. And then uh, there's this, Owen Wilson basically runs out. They're like, hey, we're going to the reef. And then you hear him go, I'll get the dynamite. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. And now back to the show. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a great I, film. I highly yeah, watch it. You will appreciate it. And uh, the last one's The Fall. Which one's that one? I haven't it, heard that one. Uh, Tarsum Sang. I can't say his second name right. I okay. I think I'm looking. Um, yeah, the guy that did The Cell. Did you ever watch oh, The yeah, Cell? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I remember The Cell. Yeah. yeah, yeah. He's got this film called The Fall, and I recommend it for anyone out there. It's one of the most beautiful films I've ever seen. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's got these amazing colors in it. Um, it's a really cute story about a, a guy telling a telling telling this fabricated story to this girl in a hospital bed, and it's yeah, it's it's absolute cinematography wise, it's probably one of the most beautiful things you'll ever see. It's yeah. it's crazy. Very cool, my friend. And where can people find out about you and your movie and your work and your production company and all that good stuff? All that good stuff. Um, yeah, so I've got a website for the film, which is www.amostsavagebeast.com. And yeah, um, production companies, uh, www.tyrantfilms.no, which is a Nor- Norwegian company. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, i got Instagram, Twitter, and it's all under my name, Theo Hogburn. So all that good stuff. All right, I'll put it uh, all in the show notes, my friend. Oh, fantastic. Vimeo too. <laughs> Theo, man, I, I want to really thank you for coming on the show and being so, you know, vulnerable and and honest and truthful about your your journey and your process. And I really do hope that this helps somebody listening to it today, man. So thank you for paying it forward in the way that you have. So thanks again, brother. No worries, man. Thanks so much, Alex, for helping me as well. Like I wouldn't have been able to get where I am without listening to the podcast. Like it's, um, yeah, it, it's, it helped me. Like you know infinitely i appreciate that man means a lot thanks again man dude thank you so much again i want to thank theo for coming on and dropping inspirational bombs on the tribe today and 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 being so raw so honest so transparent of uh and telling us all about his journey the warts and all so theo thank you again for sending me that email, and thank you again for sharing your story with the tribe today, man. We are all extremely proud of you, man, and I really hope you do well with your short film and with your films in the future. If you want to check out Theo's film and get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at IndieFilmHustle.com forward slash 340. And if you haven't already, please head over to filmmakingpodcast.com, subscribe, and leave a good review for the show. It helps me out and helps the show out tremendously. So thank you again so, so much. Now, I wanted to give you an update. I know I get, I get at least every week an email or message asking me, hey, Alex, whatever happened to Ego on the Corner of Ego and Desire, your movie you shot at Sundance? We want to watch it. Well, my friends, <laughs> I, am, I have been, as you know, busy with Film Entrepreneur and with all the other things I've been doing, and I hadn't had a chance to really get everything together. Uh, I already have a distribution deal for it. It will be available on Amazon. At first, we're just going to release on Amazon and Indie Film Hustle TV. It will be available for rent on those two platforms, and then we'll move it out to iTunes, Google Play, and all the other 
places around the world, and it will be available. But we should be releasing it sometime in September. I am delivering the film very soon, and uh, you will be seeing a new trailer for the film in the next couple weeks, I would say. Next two to three weeks, you'll see a new trailer for the film and where to go get it and where to pre-order and so on. So we should be releasing it sometime in September and uh, we'll just keep an eye out for it because I can't, honestly, I can't wait for you guys to see it. I love, love, love On the Corner of Ego Desire. Every time I watch it, I giggle. I think it's, I find it hilarious. And any filmmaker who's ever watched it, they just like, they're pissing themselves with laughter because it is, it is definitely best of show meets spinal tap for independent filmmakers without question. So, uh, and if you haven't seen what I have already on, on the corner of Ego and Desire, just head over to egoanddesirefilm.com if you want to check out the current trailer and uh, or the new trailer by the time this podcast airs and uh, check it out, guys. So I appreciate it. Thank you all for all your support as always. I've got so many things lined up for the tribe in the coming months. If you think I've put out a lot of stuff so far for the tribe, you ain't seen nothing yet. As always, keep that hustle going, keep that dream alive, and I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Indie Film Hustle podcast at IndieFilmHustle.com. That's I-N-D-I-E-F-I-L-M-H-U-S-T-L-E.com.